Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, analysis of a near miss between warships in a San Diego port. What caused the two vessels to make a close pass? We talk to an expert. And we talk with one of the first black women to receive the Distinguished Flying Cross. Hear the story behind the action that earned her the honor. And insight from a test pilot getting ready to fly the new B-21 Raider bomber. Hear his thoughts on what he expects. Finally, did Tom Hanks' reputation as a good guy just get even better? Learn about his new venture to aid veterans groups. We've got those stories and more in the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, here on Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. I'm Andrea Scott. When two U.S. warships came bow to bow in a busy waterway recently, a lot of people took notice. Two U.S. military vessels maneuvering to avoid a collision is not something the Navy wants to see in a calm harbor, especially with a pair of fatal accidents still looming over the service. Video of the close call between the guided missile destroyer Momsen and the dock landing ship Harper's Ferry surfaced on a local webcam, prompting an investigation from the Navy on what happened. For more on how the ships came into each other's paths, Navy Times reporter Jeff Zizulowitz spoke to a local expert. Warship 4-9, we are coming to this port to avoid you. Warship 9 we are coming to port to avoid you as well. So on November 29th, a strange uh, occurrence happened in San Diego Bay between two U.S. Navy ships. To help us better understand this incident, we're now joined by Sal Mercagliano. He's a marine historian and former merchant mariner who keeps track on all things naval. Sal, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. So we got this, you know, what appears, you know, externally to be some kind of harrowing footage of the destroyer Momsen, the dock landing ship Harper's Ferry, appearing to get pretty darn close there in the bay. Can you kind of take us through what happened from from your perspective? Sure. So a busy day in San Diego Harbor, 20 ship movements going on spread ac across five docking pilots for the Navy. So an extremely busy day. You had a high profile vessel coming in the Tripoli just coming back in from its deployment and here you have Harper's Ferry heading out Momsen heading in and basically the ships got themselves into a meeting situation a head-to-head -head situation while coming around a turn just above North Island and what the vessels did was basically in, in lieu of doing a port to port passage passing down the left side of each vessel they wound up doing a starboard to starboard coming down the right side, but it was fairly ad hoc. They had to do it at the very last minute. And there was a moment there where it looked like it could have been a dangerous situation, but fortunately they were able to communicate with each other, make that decision and get past each other. What is kind of the best practices for a situation like that? Would you have expected, uh, how, how would have those two ships passed ideally in a in a safe you know professional situation so, so what makes this really stand out was the fact that normally and what you saw happen just prior to this is that harper's ferry took the tripoli down its port side and that's normally what you would see is a port to port passage going out just like you drive down the road you would put your your, your vessels on on the right side of the channel and that's normally what you would do but again what you had in here was two very unique situations the harper's ferry was coming out you had a tide that was coming in at the time. And so Harper's Ferry wound up being a little bit off center in the channel, more toward the left side of the channel. 
Momsen at the same time was taking on the docking pilot. So they had a tug alongside the starboard quarter and they were forced to maintain a course and speed until that pilot was on board. And really, again, what you had was a happenstance here where both vessels began to make their turn almost simultaneously at each other. And fortunately, they were able to get on communications and decide to take the starboard, the starboard passage. Not a violation of the rules of the road, as it's perfectly what you can do. But it was a very high vis incident taking place in San Diego Harbor, especially after a round of collisions have taken place over the past few years with Porter in the Persian Gulf and Fitzgerald and McCain, which resulted in losses of lives in 2017 in the Western Pacific. But just based on your experience in this in this sector, do you see fault there or do you see, uh, you know, I mean, is this just something that kind of happens, but it was just very high visibility because it was captured on camera and, you know, went viral for a news cycle? I, I think it highlights a couple of issues that are, that are really important. Number one, I think communication between the ship should have happened earlier. Harper's Ferry took the turn too soon and really put itself into the side of the channel where Momsen should have been. Uh, this is a very tight area of the channel. They should have better coordinated where they would be doing their meeting. The fact that Momsen was taking the pilot on board, for example, really forced it to maintain a course and speed that didn't allow it to come on the inside of Harper's Ferry. I, I also think there, I think the thing about this issue that's really in particularly that we should take note of is it avoided a collision, which is the most important thing. Do you view this as, you know, a fireable offense uh, for somebody aboard, you know, one of those ships? Or do you think this is best? uh taken as kind of a, a sobering you know lesson for you know those who are in charge of those vessels no i, I think this is a learnable moment and i i don't think anyone should lose a job or even get dinged at, at all for this because they were able to extricate themselves out of the situation which is what you want you you exactly want to happen what happened now you could make the argument well they shouldn't have gotten themselves in that situation which i think is the learnable moment that's the thing you want to talk about why was it that Harper's Ferry made the turn when it did? Why was Momsen taking the pilot on board when it got into that situation and really couldn't uh, maneuver like it should? I, I think, you know, it's really important to take these moments. And again, we, we have it caught on film. I think it should be talked about more with ship handling. Thelmer Cagliano, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. This is Jeff Zuluwitz with Navy Times. And in other news from around the military, the Air Force confirmed it has conducted its first test launch of a fully operational hypersonic weapon recently. Called the Air Launched Rapid Response Weapon, made by Lockheed Martin, the missile was launched out of a B-52 Stratofortress out of Edwards Air Force Base in California. The Air Force said the weapon accelerated to more than five times the speed of sound once in the air and then detonated at the end of its flight path. During the recent unveiling of the U.S.'s newest stealth bomber, one of the test pilots slated to fly the aircraft, talk about what he expects to see once in the cockpit. Lieutenant Colonel Clifton Bell said the B-21 Raider's specialized windows offered a change from previous bombers, and talked about how the Air Force would evaluate the new flagship bomber once it was ready for flight tests. Specifically about the B-2 and the windows, when I first started flying the B-2, you notice it the first flight, maybe the first hour, yeah. and then your mind's pretty good about separating what's important and what's not important. So I, I, I guess overall, I, I don't have any concern. I, I'm yet to fly with windows that I'm concerned with. We'll be looking at everything, everything that it does. You know, how does it feel? Is it doing what, it, what it's predicted to do? We're recording all kinds of data that's going to be uh, transmitted to the ground. We'll have a control room looking at all the systems, how the airplane is uh, acting on the ground as well. So really, we're there to help collect the data. And a very valuable part of that data is our opinions on, is it working the way it was designed? Is it working the way that we practiced in the simulators and pass all that information down to the uh, engineers? And finally, patron saint of Hollywood, Tom Hanks, has stepped up to match fellow Forrest Gump alum, Gary Sinise, as a benefactor of the military and veterans communities. Known for roles as US service members, no, not that one. Known for playing members of the military, 
No, not that one either. Okay, now we're talking. Known for his involvement in films like Saving Private Ryan and the Band of Brothers series, Hanks has launched a new coffee line called Hanks for Our Troops, with all profits being donated to veterans groups. The line of drinks includes ground coffee and pods, as well as an instant coffee stick, and the star says 100% of the profits go to support a range of veterans organizations. And that's it from around the military. When we return, a groundbreaking female pilot is honored by the Air Force. And later, a Marine icon gets a promotion. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. I'm Andrea Scott. In the chaotic final days of evacuating people from the Kabul airport in 2021, Air Force Captain Rhea McFarland with the 14th Airlift Squadron found herself in the middle of a tense situation. A C-17 pilot based in South Carolina, McFarland flew some of the missions that would result in dozens of distinguished flying crosses for airmen tasked with the airlifts. In the wake of events in Kabul, McFarland and another black woman became the first black females to receive the 96-year-old award. McFarland recently spoke with Military Times reporter Sarah Sicard about the experience. You were the first black woman to receive the Distinguished Flying Cross. Uh, what does that mean you know, for you and you know, for future generations of airmen? For me, it was an exciting moment to hear that. Um, sometimes, um, it can be shocking to hear that you're still the first of something, but at the same time, I know that I'm a part of a small community, one of African-Americans and then African-American females. And I guess for the future uh, generations of airmen, it makes me excited uh, for smaller communities like the one that I was from um, to understand the opportunities that lie for them um, or you know that can be available for them within the Air Force and then within the airlift or uh, just whether that's flying or being a load master, it just makes me excited to see um, that they have these opportunities available for them. And then uh, just in general, being grateful for this opportunity to be awarded alongside my uh, my crewmates, as well as other airmen. You were assigned to the 437th Airlift Wing, Air Lift Wing and on the last day um, in Kabul, can you sort of describe you know, the chaos of what was going on um, before that final flight? Well, one, it was super chaotic being that we went in at night. And for some reason, when you go under the cover of night, that just makes things automatically um, more intense. But, um, there was a lot of ground movement that was occurring, a lot of um, fire in terms of uh, shots being, you know, in, uh, being uh, shot into the air, <laughs> for lack of better words. So um, that created just a real chaotic picture. Um, but fortunately, just a team of professionals, uh, you know, from the uh, other pilots and load masters that I worked with, as well as uh, just the team that was on the ground, uh, ensuring that the uh, planes were kept saved. Uh, so that just made everything run a lot more smoother than it could have. What were you feeling, you know, when you you sort of took off from Kabul for the last time? Did you know it was going to be your final flight out? Yes, we knew it was going to be our final flight, um, just from the different announcements being made as well as the briefings that we um, had uh, in preparation going into Kabul for the final night. It was uh, very methodical, very planned out. Um, and then, so we were all um, aware that, you know, this was the, the last time for really to showcase what Air Mobility Command can bring to the fight. What were you feeling knowing that this was sort of the end of, you know, our activities in Afghanistan? I guess I was feeling just a little bit of relief knowing, you know, we had been there for a while, um, but then also just uh, grateful seeing the progress that we had made, um, the amount of people that we were able to evacuate. So uh, a sense of relief and then also um, just a sense of 
uh, gratitude to be able to be a part of it all. 51 airmen were recognized in November for, you know, acts during the Afghanistan evacuation. What do you think about, you know, when people call you guys heroes? It, it can be a little strange, uh, just for myself, you know, I can't speak to everyone else, um, but I think we can all agree that we were there really just to do our job, do what we were trained to do. So uh, while super grateful for, you know, the title as well as the award, um, ultimately it just came down to um, being a crew and, and doing what we were called upon. You joined in 2017, so you I assume you have a long career ahead of you. You know, what are you hoping to do with the rest of your Air Force career? I have currently about six years remaining, at least on my commitment. Um, I do plan on continuing my journey with the Air Force uh, following that, but I actually just came back from some training. I had been a co-pilot for a, a little while, and, and so just going into that next phase of my career being the being an aircraft commander being in charge and taking responsibility um, that is what i'm looking forward to and then just also getting into some specialized fields within the c-17 community when we return personal finance expert jeanette mack drops by with her latest tips for investing for the long haul Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack sheds light on strategies for investing in your future. Take it away, Jeanette. Making the decision to invest in your financial well being means committing to saving your hard earned money and making sure it's working just as hard for you. It takes patience, tenacity, and a bit of homework. Start by setting goals. What do you want to accomplish in the future? You want to pay off student loans or maybe buy a new car? A high yield savings account is the way to go. Then carve out a budget that lets you pay yourself first. Treat your savings like a bill, something you pay monthly, and make it automatic by transferring it from your checking at regular intervals. This builds over time and becomes as effortless as breathing, while giving you breathing room in your wallet. And finally, start investing. Your financial institution may have options for investing. If you're a beginner, look for easy, low minimums and digital investing platforms for convenience. Or talk to someone at your bank or credit union for help. These days, you don't have to have wads of cash to invest. You can start with as low as 50 bucks a month and maybe less. The point is to just get started. Your future really does depend on it. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next time. To get more coverage of military and defense topics, trudge across the digital no man's land to Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com. And to be the smartest sailor in the submarine when it comes to recent news, sign up for our early bird brief for stories delivered to your inbox each weekday. And it's even an audio. Check out the podcast version out now. When we come back, in the near future, military facilities will need to become smart bases in order to deal with threats and operate safely. We talk to experts working on the idea. While the U.S. enjoys an advantage in all kinds of smart tech, one less common area of intelligence applies to military bases. In fact, smart bases that can intelligently respond to threats and allow complex communication in challenged environments are part of the DOD's plan. For more on the topic from our webcast series, a smart base expert spoke to C4 ISRNet reporter Colin Demarest about the future of the concept. Here's part of that conversation. And so smart basing is not necessarily just in the Air Force or the Space Force. It is a Defense Department-wide endeavor, correct? Yeah, it is a Defense Department-wide endeavor. The Air Force has an interesting challenge because our bases are our force projection platforms. And so we have to think about them differently from how we operate our missions there um, and how we you know, conduct things like our you know, kind of vital space mission and our, uh, our Air Force uh, maintenance and, and logistics operations. And so there are a great number of things for us that are really more deeply tied into the mission when we think about smart bases. So what do you think predicated this shift from what I, I'll call dumb bases <laughs> to this, this focus on uh, smart bases? 
Um, so I, I think a lot of it is um, is technology here is really acting like uh, it's really kind of creating a pressure valve um, to push these things forward, right? You know, we have um, a new generation of uh, very tech literate uh, airmen and guardians, right? When you have an 18 year old who who shows up, um, you know, they don't want to be on you know a heavy brick laptop or being you know unable to move back and forth between you know the flight line and the depot, right? It makes sense to have like, oh, you know, we have a we have a tablet that we can work on, uh, you know, order parts immediately from the depot down the road. We want to be able to uh, make sure that we have up to date training, right? So a lot of it is uh, the possibility of what's available in commercial technologies and and how other similar industries in airlines and maintenance and logistics, how those industries are being revolutionized by technology and, and really allowing us to leverage a lot of kind of our national innovations to to, to make it uh, a, a more efficient place to to move, uh, to, to be able to work and, and to be able to execute. We are, as a nation, we are up against, um, you know, adversaries that have, um, in some cases, uh, physically larger forces, right? And so, uh, you know, the efficiency that you're able to produce by having um, smart connected bases with the right infrastructure in places um, it is massive and and it's a it's an obvious way to to uh, get more out of our force without really you know pushing people um, sort of individually right to be able to to allow and and you see this through ITAS you see this through other efforts where um, a lot of the focus of the force of the future are to think of the things what are the things that um, only the military can do? What are the things that technology can do? What are the things that you don't want to have to have, uh, you know, you don't want to have an airman running around patching systems or, or running cable when you can have either an automated system or, or some contract uh, to do that. So it is a rethinking of um, of what the military specific jobs in the military are. DOD officials have set upon themselves a 2027 deadline for zero trust implementation or a, a degree of it, at least. Do you think that's realistic? Uh, can it be done in that time frame? It will depend on how you define zero trust. Um, and so, uh, so, 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 if it you could you could get to twenty twenty seven realistically if you put a bunch of asterisks next to it, right? You said for critical applications, um, uh, you know, and you've gone far enough, right? So, so zero trust is is a is a constant evolution of things. You'll never there's no defined endpoint. You'll always be able to tighten things up and, and fix your processes more um, and, you know, uh, better segment your network and better understand um, your cyber posture, right? So the way that I think about cyber defense, cyber defense is, uh, or kind of cyber risk is the gap between, uh, between what you know and understand and reality, right? And so when you, you know, as we go through the zero trust maturation, we're going to be learning more and more about reality. We're going to be refactoring applications. We're going to be um, setting infrastructure. We're going to be creating better common services. We're going to get more people into those common services that that provide more of that underlying baseline. And so um, we we will get there. We will have capabilities um, uh, there. Uh, it, will it be enough? I mean, it it will have to be. And we're gonna we are late to need. Um, so I I believe that we will get there. Uh, we will have the right services available. And then as with all things inside of a gigantic enterprise, it will be prioritizing what needs, where we need to close that information gap most, right? Critical weapon systems, uh, you know, critical platforms for the Air Force, uh, critical locations. Um, and, and then and then there will be that long tail, you know, as, as various technology life cycles hit, you know, um, tools and business systems and, uh, and and kind of our our legacy elements uh, that will that will force that update to a baseline which has zero more zero trust principles as an architectural imperative baked into them. Um, so we we will get there, um, but it will you know I, I we tell people all the time right like it, it this is a ten to fifteen year journey, which in the military is two to you know two to five leadership changes, right? And so we're all going to have to have the stamina to be able to carry this message when you're not the first one and you're not the last one, right? And so we're on a really long journey here that's going to have to continue past us. And so we have to just consider the longevity of the effort and not get fatigue on the zero trust message.
And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.